my other classes too, I haven't been uh -huh. able to actually get them. A lot of us are like back ordered. Yeah. This is the, the, the yeah, the, the, this, the, this is nuts. Mm -hmm. It didn't used to be this way, I thought. No. Well, like my it, first it semester or two, I got my books no problem. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to go too too deeply into the, the history of our our, our uh, campus institutions, but yeah, we used to have our own independent bookstore, and then to save money, we switched over to a, a corporate partner. The corporate partners' policies, um, let's say, benefit the corporate partner more than they benefit us. Uh huh. Okay. So. For next time, remember to finish the vocabulary quiz by Sunday at Sunday midnight, right? Everybody did last time, so you know, I'm sure you will again, but I'll send everybody a reminder on Sunday morning, just so that no one forgets. Um, you're going to be finishing Heart of Darkness for Tuesday. Um, so does anybody have any questions about anything? By the way, really impressed so far with what you all are doing with the, uh, the quizzes. Um, you're giving good, thoughtful answers back. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'm really, really enjoying reading them. All right, so let's talk about Joseph Conrad. I know that some of you, um, some of you are familiar with this book um, and already have uh, very, very strong opinions. I have very strong opinions about this book myself. So I guess first, uh, first off, I just kind of want to hear from y'all um, how this first part is going for you. How many of you have read this before? Just you? Yeah. Okay. I hate it as much this time as I did the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's okay. Um, I, I don't know, so far I just wish the other people would like talk. I mean, I guess it's the whole point of the story uh -huh. that we just see like his interaction with like going down to Africa and like seeing all these like slave people through the company and stuff. Uh -huh. But um, it's definitely, I don't remember, I guess like explicit. I mean, like we see like really like horrible things happening. Yeah. Like, yeah, and I think you're hitting on an interesting thing. That, like at least, like it seems like so far, Marlo is just about the only character who's even given a name, right? Pretty much everybody else is nameless, and relatively few other characters really even speak. What about you, Brandon? How's this going for you? So I'm not as immediately emotionally invested in it as I was with Dorian Gray. Okay. So but I'm very intrigued. Personally, I like when a story has grit to it. I like it when it has that dark, that kind of harsh reality with uh -huh. all the horrible things happening. It's intriguing okay. to me, and it makes you think about things that you usually glaze over because it's not something you want to know is going on. Okay. So I like that part of it. I kind of like when stories have that because it like forces you to think about things. Okay. But I'm not, I need to give it a little bit more before I can decide whether or not I'm like really on board or not on board. I'm, I'm in the middle right now. Okay, now so let's hear from the not on board camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I read this the first time. Uh -huh. I was, I was like 16. And I remember the teacher I had was teaching us the first time. He loved it, and he was like, uh -huh. "It's so good!" Like it, the the ex like the explicitness of it. He like preached on how good it was. And uh -huh. I just remember sitting there like, "This is the worst book I've ever read in my entire life." <laughs> and I hated Kurtz, and he loved Kurtz. I was like, "I want to uh -huh. punch him in the face." Okay. And I hated Marlo too. <laughs> I just kind of hated it all, but um, there's like. So I your was, teacher oversold it. Yeah, that was part of the problem. He was okay. like, he was like, they're in the jungle. It's ivory traders. There's gonna be like fighting. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, uh -huh. I was kind of thinking like Indiana Jones type stuff. It's not. 
it was not Indiana Jones. And uh-huh. <laughs> it get, it, like the first section, I was like, okay, this is okay. Like it's it's not uh-huh. as it's not as good as I thought it was gonna be. It's good. And then we got into the middle of it. And I don't. We were not there yet. Yeah. But like at the end, there's like this one specific part. And I was immediately just like, I hate this book. I'm done. <laughs> Goodbye. And I told him that, and he uh-huh. was very offended that I did not like his book. But I just. I just don't uh-huh. think it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. And I will say, to, like, and I think th- this is one of the kind of like, the ways into this I want to talk about is that a lot of people are actually deeply offended by this book. Um, and I'm going to be honest. I always weigh very heavily uh, whether I'm going to continue teaching it or not. Um, for some of these reasons. Now, like, I'll explain in a minute why I do continue teaching it, but I find a lot of the arguments against teaching it and against including it in the canon pretty persuasive. So, um, one of the uh, sources that I put on your bibliography for this time uh, is a, uh, it's a, um, a lecture by the Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe. And Achebe's argument is that Heart of Darkness is essentially kind of irredeemably racist and reduces um, Africa to a backdrop for a story about um, European regression into savagery um, and reduces Africans um, to basically props in that story and that nothing about artistic merit or experiment and dialogue or anything like that can really redeem any of that. And, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna say, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I, I buy that. I mean, I can also see arguments that say that uh, Marla, that not Marla, Joseph Conrad is attempting to, um, you know, expose some of the brutality at the heart of imperialism and colonialization but while doing so, he doesn't really humanize any of the African characters. And one thing that I want to, I want you to, it didn't really come up much in this part, but when, whenever Marlowe references feeling any kind of kinship to any of the African characters, I want you to um, really kind of trace his emotional response to that, because that's a big part of kind of like the problem here. So the reason I do continue to teach this, despite my own very strong misgivings about it, um, primarily because it illustrates one of the darker tendencies in modernism, right? So on one hand, yeah, it is a kind of experimental narrative, right? Everything we've read so far has in some way been a kind of literary experiment. So Dorian Gray is trying to marry the form of the, the novel, right, to aesthetic theory and even kind of a little bit of psychological theory, right? Um, Candida took the basic form of the 19th century formulaic romantic comedy and turned it into a kind of conversation about um, Victorian gender roles. Um, and Heart of Darkness is also doing something that's kind of formally experimental, right? So, how many different layers of narrative do we have here? So far. How many different narrators do we have? We have Yeah, this is Marlowe's story, right? Yeah, we have Marlowe at one layer. We have the narrator as a kind of outer layer, telling us a little bit about Marlowe. And then when we get to the second part, we'll also get like some of Kurtz in his own words as well. And then kind of back out to Marlowe and this kind of outer narrator, right? So what are the 
What kind of picture of Marlowe, the storyteller here, does this outer narrator give us? What does his attitude towards Marlowe seem to be? still a sailor, right? Mm -hmm. Right, we have the, the other, we, we don't know what the narrator does now, but the other three that are there with them are referred to only as the director of companies, right? So basically a CEO. The lawyer and the accountants. So most of these other guys Right, most of Marlowe's friends here have settled into these very kind of conventional business careers, right? They've become conventional landbound professionals while Marlowe still follows the sea, right? But how excited do they seem to be to actually sit and listen to Marlowe's story? Probably about as excited as Sam is, right? <laughs> if we look on page five, right? <clears throat> I suppose you fellows remember I did once turn freshwater sailor for a bit, that we knew we were fated before the ebb began to run to hear about one of Marlowe's inconclusive experiences. Right, so apparently this is something Marlowe does a lot, right? And his friends are kind of bored with it. It's like, okay, great, he's going to tell us a story and it's going to resolve into nothing, essentially. I like that, like the old person, like, back in my day, and then he goes off of this picture. <laughs> like, like, hike 12 miles each way, it's all, yeah. Uh-huh. Fishermen and sailors are known for telling stories, mm -hmm. especially tall tales. Oh, yeah. They they're known for exaggerating things and uh -huh. making them seem bigger than they were. Mm -hmm. So that might have something to do with their apprehension to listening to uh -huh. him drone on. Okay, yeah, they, they know what sailors' tales are like, right? But I think the, the, the thing I want to, the thing that I think is key here in their apprehension of Marlowe is this phrase, inconclusive experiences. All right, he's going to tell them a story that has no real resolution in it. And it's ultimately just going to leave them unsatisfied. Uh, there's another point um, at which the, uh, the narrator says that um, what they actually want from the story um, is some sense of Marlowe himself, or some light actually shed on Marlowe himself in the story, but he never, they never get that sort of thing from him. So on the one hand, you know, we do have this kind of this, this narrative that pits, you know, the lifelong seaman in some sense against his now land-bound friends, right? But there is another, like apart from formal experiments, there is another reason why I do continue to teach this. And it's because there's a strong tendency in modernism towards a certain kind of cultural appropriation.
So if we think back to um, the cultural beliefs and practices of the decadence, right? What was one of the central beliefs that animated decadence as an artistic mode? Where did the decadence thought they think they stood in relation to history? Or to the future? Yeah, right. They're thinking of themselves as standing at the end of history, right? That there isn't really going to be anything more. This is it. This is all we get and will be. So, <clears throat> one of the pathways out of this, apart from sort of like simple experiment with existing forms, um, is to look to other parts of the world for inspiration. Um, and one of the problems with this is this always involved a certain level of misunderstanding, uh, misapprehension of other cultures, right? But <clears throat> from the European perspective, um, Africa and India in particular looked to be full of life and energy, where Europe looked desiccated, Paid and slow, right? So, uh, for example, if we look at like the earliest examples of what comes to be called cubist paintings, like some of Picasso's early uh, um, early cubist experiments, for example, a lot of the faces in those paintings look like African masks. A lot of uh, modern dance companies imitate um, African and Indian and Caribbean dance steps. Um, try to incorporate that into the European art tradition. Um, you know, you will also you find um, someone like T.S. Eliot in the Wasteland, which we'll read in a couple of weeks, trying to incorporate um, <clears throat> Indian philosophy into a poem essentially about the decay and degradation of the West. Um, and the assumption here is not only that these cultures they're drawing from are more energetic, but that they're more energetic because they're primitive, right? So there's an assumption of primitivism. That walks hand in hand with this. Um, because these other cultures did not develop along the same technological lines as Europe, right? That the difference in technology is regarded as a difference in level of culture or level of civilization, right? And I think that we see a lot of this in the ways that um, Conrad tends to depersonalize the African characters um, in this text. And there is a real, um, there's a dialogue here with the, you know, we were talking about anthropology before class. If we look at the history of anthropology, right, there is kind of a lot there to answer for as well. So when the doctor is measuring Marlowe's head as he's like signing up with the company in Brussels, um, figuring out, um, you know, where he needs to go and what he needs to do. Did, did anybody notice what the doctor was doing in his examination of him? Anything weird about the examination? It's on page nine. Um, did he say something about how he was like going to measure his brain because of yeah. how um, people like go crazy out there on the sea? Is that what it was? Yeah, something about him going crazy. Yeah, it's on, you know, page nine. Right? Yeah, the old doctor felt my pulse. Evidently thinking of something else the while. Good, good for there, he mumbled. And then with a certain eagerness, asked me whether I would let him measure my head. So, why does the doctor want to measure Marlowe's head? 
Anybody have any idea? I have an idea, but I don't think it's real. Okay, well, what's your idea? What do you think? So, it kind of reminds, at first, I thought that he was measuring him for a coffin, because the last guy that they sit <laughs> down there to do this died. And yeah, and, and nobody seems to expect him to come back, yes. right? Also, my idea that I'm thinking of, so there's a movie. Uh-huh. Many people find it very offensive. Um, Django. It has a D in front of it, but I don't know how to say it. Oh, okay, it's with lizards or something, right? It's animated? But that's Rango. Oh. So there's another one, and it's about slavery. Um, it has Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Oh, okay, so it was a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yes, right? okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. A lot right, of people yeah. find it very offensive, uh -huh. but there's a scene which I remember because everyone made a big deal about it because Leonardo actually like sliced his hand open uh -huh. during the scene. And he's talking about the skulls of African Americans being different, like the inside being different than mm -hmm. European or white people. And I just, it kind of, him measuring the skulls and them bringing people back and forth and doing not so lovely experimentation. Yeah. Yeah, you, you you are you are yeah you are on the right track here with what we're what what, what is what is going on here. Um, so yeah, so um, what the uh, the doctor here, uh, who is you know probably a quack, is doing is uh, it's called craniometry. And so there are kind of two assumptions baked into the science of craniometry. So what he would do is take, like, do you all know what calipers are? Does anybody know what calipers are? Isn't it that thing that, it kind of has like handles like scissors and they like have a yeah, round Yeah, it, looks, well, it, it looks, looks, almost, looks almost like a great big round pair of tongs. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, they would use that to measure the size of your, your skull, your brain pan, right? They use it in like hat fittings and stuff too. <laughs> well, all right, interesting. They still use it for something. All right. I've actually never been fitted for a hat, so I'm not, a, not familiar. But yeah, so the, the first basic assumption in craniometry was that intelligence can be measured by measuring the size of your skull. that if you have a bigger skull, and if your face is angled a particular way, that indicates that you are more intelligent, right? The size and shape of your skull are indications of your intelligence. Now, when classifying skull types and skull shapes according to intelligence, these early anthropologists, who were mostly from Northwestern Europe, tended to classify Northwestern European types as being at the top, and African and Indian types as being at the bottom, right? So, racial distinctions are encoded into this whole pseudoscience, right? But you see medical, scientific, and anthropological textbooks uh, filled with pictures uh, like, the one I'm, like the ones I'm about to show you here. see kind of like a series of human faces here, you know, from a, you know, an Anglo-Saxon face on the right. Now this is, this is your left. You know, to a Mediterranean face, to an Indian face, to an Australian Aboriginal face, 
to an African face, right? And as the angle of the face gets more extreme, the argument was the intelligence gets lower. Now, <clears throat> we know now that um, the size of your head, and indeed the size of your brain, has absolutely nothing to do with your intelligence. And that differences in facial structures and skull shapes are entirely due to environmental factors. Uh, but this was um, a really pervasive idea in the late 19th century, right? And it was often used as a justification for the brutal treatment that European nations would meet out to Africans and to Indians, right? So, <clears throat> essentially what the doctor here is doing is yeah, he wants to measure Marlowe's intelligence, right? And you know, measure, measure him as a particular type. Right? You'll, uh, rather surprised, I said yes, when he produced a thing like calipers and got the dimensions back to front in every way, taking notes carefully. He was an unshaven little man in the first of the with his feet and slippers, and I thought him a harmless fool. Do y'all know what a gabardine is? Okay, so a gabardine is a garment that a Catholic priest wears. So yeah, so this little old funny doctor measuring his head with the calipers is dressed almost like a priest. I always ask Lee, in the interest of science, to measure the crania of those going out there, he said. And when they come back too, I asked, oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. He smiled as if it's some quiet joke. So what's the expect, what, what's the quiet joke here? That he cracks their heads open and looks up the inside. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a psychopath. Okay, well. This <laughs> great little man scares me. Well, he, Marlowe is expecting that the doctor's going to want to remeasure him when he comes back, right? But he's expecting that Marlowe's not going to come back. So what then does it suggest the, the doctor's quiet joke is? He's going to die. Yeah, that he's going to die out there. Everybody does. So, <clears throat> to give you a little bit more background for all of this, right? So this is written in the late 1890s during what historians call the scramble for Africa. So, most prior colonization efforts had been in uh, the Americas, um, in the Indian subcontinent, things like that. So a lot of the um, available land for, con uh, for colonization in lands that were well known to Europeans um, was kind of like already claimed. Right? Not only that, there was an increasing appetite for African goods, particularly ivory. Right? So you know, we see here in this how hungry everybody is to get their hands on ivory. Right? That's the big thing that's driving um, <clears throat> basically all of the activity in these stations and all of the activity along the river. So. In the 1870s, King Leopold II of Belgium uh, founds two groups. The first is the International African Association.
And this is supposed to be a philanthropic organization. They're supposed to be doing missionary work and medical relief work and doing things like building, ro uh, building roads, uh, laying down railroads, things like that, right? Funding, um, you know, what people at the time would have called civilizing initiatives. However, the International African Association was largely a front for another group that King Leopold founded called the International Congo Society. And the International Congo Society's interests were purely commercial. So the philanthropic efforts were purely to give cover to Belgium's efforts to get its hands on more ivory. So as more and more European nations are scrambling to get their hands on this you know, fairly limited resource, right? Because you have to either find it in an elephant graveyard or kill an elephant to get it. In 1888, the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck calls a, a conference in Berlin and invites 14 of the European and North American powers that have some stake or some interest in African colonization, right? So the nations invited are Germany, France, Austria-Hungary, Great Britain, Belgium, Italy, Denmark, Spain, the Netherlands, Portugal, the United States, Russia, Sweden, and the Ottoman Empire. And the basic purpose of the conference is for them to try to hash out an agreement over who has influence where in West Africa. So the agreement they come up with, they call the General Act. And it has the following principles. One, they have to give the veneer of moral improvement to all of this. So, They argue that the purpose of all of this is to abolish the slave trade in native controlled African territory, right? To stop these various non-Christian rulers in Africa to, uh, from trading slaves. This is, again, mostly cover for their real motives. One of the things that the Act does is grant the property that the International Congo Society has already mapped out and started to settle
right, is granted to King Leopold as his personal property. Lucky him. And it comes to be known as the Congo Free State. Uh, the modern nation of the Democratic Republic of Congo um, is there. However, it also guarantees free trade amongst the signatories of the General Act in the Congo Basin. Right, so along the Congo River Basin, all of these nations are to have free trading rights with each other. The two major West African rivers, the Niger and the Congo, are free to European ship traffic. All right, this is basically what allows for Marlowe's job, right? He's apparently working for a Belgian company, but the people he meets on the river include Swedes and Danes and Frenchmen, right? you know, people of a variety of different European ethnic origins. It also sets specific borders for each nation's different sphere of influence. So um, if we look on page 7, bottom of the page. Right, deal table in the middle, plain chairs all around the walls, on one end a large shining map marked with all the colors of a rainbow. There was a vast amount of red, good to see at any time because one knows that some real work is being done in there. A deuce of a lot of blue, a little green, smears of orange, and on the east coast a purple, a purple patch to show where the jolly poly painters of progress drink the jolly lager beer. So yeah, these colors are all referring to specific nation spheres of influence, right? The red is Great Britain, the blue is France, um, the orange is the Netherlands, uh, no, the orange I believe is Belgium, the purple is Germany, and I can't remember who the green is. But yeah, the, all, all of these different nations are now represented on the map, right? Now, what did Marlowe, when he was talking about maps earlier, think of Africa as on the map? Oh, wasn't it like a snake or something? The river is like a snake, right? The Congo is like the Congo River is like a snake to him. Why is it like a blank space? Yeah, he talks about blank spaces, right? Turn to page five, right? Now, when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. At that time, there were many blank spaces on the earth. And when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, but they all looked bad, I would put my finger on it and say, when I grow up, I will go there. The North Pole was one of those places, I remember. Well, I haven't been there yet and shall not try now. The glamour's off. Other places were scattered about the equator, and every sort of latitude over the two hemispheres, I had been in some of them. And well, we won't talk about that. But there was one, the biggest, most blank, so to speak, that I had a hankering after. And I think this gets to one of the criticisms that Achebe makes about the way the novel treats Africa generally, right? 
this idea, even though like um, Conrad doesn't specifically use this phrase, of the dark continents. Right? The map of Africa is just a blank. Now, from whose, like, this is all kind of a matter of perspective, right? From whose perspective is the map of blank? Someone who hasn't been there? Yeah. From a European perspective, right? Yeah. They don't know what's in there, right? But that doesn't mean that no one does. But the things that the native population knows don't really matter to Conrad, right? What matters is the, blank, the big blank space that's now being filled up with different colors, right? These different colors claiming little bits of it, right? Um, the last important part of this general act, it enforced what was called the principle of effective occupation. Now, can any of you guess what this might mean um, if you're talking about attempting to colonize a region. What effective occupation might be. Drive the people out. What's that? Like drive the people who are there out? Or get them to like follow your rules? It didn't actually necessarily mean that. You didn't necessarily have to drive the people who were already there out. Mm -hmm. Unless they were from one of these other countries. Right. Total control of the didn't even have to be total control. What effective occupation meant was just you had to put some people on the ground there, right? You couldn't just claim it and say, this is mine, right? I put a flag here, now I'm gonna leave. If you wanted to claim territory, you had to settle people there. So we see these desultory little camps and settlements that Marlowe passes through on his way to the station. These are largely the results of this principle of effective occupation, right? Even if there's no particular reason for people to be there, you have to settle a certain number of people in the territory in order for it to be considered yours. I have a really stupid question. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so like the so obviously they're colonizing Africa. Yeah. But would South Africa have already been colonized, like for the slave trade? Like, what if they have previously like already colonized most ah, of well, this see area? That, that's the thing, right? Prior to the late 19th century, pretty much all European outco outposts in Africa were on the coast. Okay. And they didn't go into the interior. So they're just like on the outside. Yeah. They okay. Yeah, yeah, and they, they, they were really like they weren't even. There weren't even really colonization efforts in Africa, per se. There were just trading posts. Oh. Um, and Portugal actually had the most of them. Um, I was just like, what if there are people down there? <laughs> yeah, well, and that, that was in, like, they, in, instead of actually settling in the interior and taking slaves, what they would typically do was incite various local leaders against each other right, to go to war, capture slaves, and sell them to the Europeans, right? So that was, that was how the, the, the slave trade typically worked before it was abolished in most of Europe, right? But I think yeah, that's actually kind of one, one other impetus, apart from the desire for ivory, um, that starts driving the scramble for Africa, even though there's one of their stated goals is getting rid of the slave trade altogether, right? The end of the slave trade also it creates certain economic holes in Europe more broadly, right? Holes that they want ivory to fill. Yeah. And diamonds. Ivory and diamonds. Yeah. Although, yeah, diamonds were. Diamonds was a big thing. Yeah, diamonds were really more in uh, the southern tip of Africa. Um, West Africa was ivory they were after. So. <clears throat> This is the basic background here, right? So let's, try, let's talk a little bit about the way the text handles it.
And the way the text handles um, Marlowe's experience is both kind of like setting up his tail, getting ready to go out to Africa, and then kind of like what he finds when he gets there, right? So what's the basic situation in which Marlowe is telling his story? What's going on here? We've talked a little bit about who's there, who's listening to him, right? Where are they? Um, they're on, are they on the River Thames? Yeah, they're a boat in the River Thames, yeah. Um, so what do you think this meant? Why, do, why, does, why does it matter that they're on the Thames, do you think? Why does this get Marlowe thinking about his experiences in Africa? I mean, most of the... The story takes place on a river. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the idea is like, yeah, he's trying to think of, you know, like, compare. It's a compare and contrast between the two rivers, right? The Thames versus the Congo. And I think we'll get a little bit more deeply into that next time as we read the rest of this, right? But yeah, they're, you know, they're they're in the Thames. They're a place specifically called Gravesend. which is um, in uh, Kent in southeastern England. It's just uh, looking at just southeast of London. And the name, actually, the name of the town doesn't actually have anything to do with death or with cemeteries, right? But there is that kind of suggestion here of you know, places of the dead, right? Graves End. And I think we can compare this to the, the way he describes Brussels as well, right? So he sets off, like, Brussels is never actually named, but if we know he's working for a Belgian company and he's in their capital, it's Brussels. How does he refer to Brussels? Did any of you catch that? What does he call it? Or what does it make him think of? If we look on page seven, the middle bit, it's the first full paragraph on page seven, the middle paragraph there. What does Brussels make him think of? Okay. <laughs> but do you know what it means? <laughs> Not at all. Okay. All right. So maybe that maybe that's our challenge here. Okay. So he describes Brussels as being like a whited sepulcher. Does anybody know what a sepulcher is? Okay. Sepulcher is a tomb. So I think what we're actually getting in some of his Conrad's descriptions here of Europe are ideas that really kind of come out of decadence, right? Uh, you know, this is a, you, these are places where history has already happened, and it's now kind of dead and buried, right? So you know, the first thing that Marlowe says to the others. On page three is what? It's actually the first words anybody speaks in the novel directly. He says this is like the darkest place on earth. Yes, and this also, said Marlowe suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. So he's thinking of the Thames in terms of its past and in terms of the process of, you know, make, like you've got this, this river that goes through 
one of the biggest city, one of the biggest and oldest cities in the world, right? But London wasn't always there, right? If you look at the bottom of page three here, right? His remark did not seem at all surprising. It was just like Marlowe. It was accepted in silence. No one took the trouble to grunt even. And presently he said very slow, I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here, 1900 years ago, the other day. Light came out of this river since, you say nights? Yes, but it is like a running blaze on a plain, like a flash of lightning in the clouds. We live in the flicker. May it last as long as the old earth keeps rolling. But darkness was here yesterday. Imagine the feelings of commander of a fine, what do you call him, trireme in the Mediterranean, ordered suddenly to the north. Run overland across the Gauls in a hurry. Put in charge of one of these craft, the legionaries, a wonderful lot of handy men they must have been too, used to build. Apparently by the hundred in a month or two, if we may believe what we read. Imagine him here, the very end of the world, a sea the color of lead, a sky the color of smoke, a kind of ship about as rigid as a concertina, and going up this river with stores or orders or what you like. Sandbanks, marshes, forests, savages, precious little to, uh, to eat fit for a civilized man. Nothing but Thames water to drink. No Falernian wine here, no going ashore. Here and there a military camp lost in the wilderness, like a needle in a bundle of hay. Cold, fog, tempests, disease, exile, and death. Death skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush. They must have been dying like flies here. Oh yes, he did it. Did it very well, too, no doubt, and without thinking much about it either, except afterwards to brag about what he had gone through in his time, perhaps. They were men enough to face the darkness, and perhaps he was cheered by keeping his eye on a chance of promotion to the fleet of Ravenna by and by, if he had good friends in Rome and survived the awful climate. Or think of a decent young citizen in a toga, perhaps too much dice, you know, coming out here in the train of some prefect or tax gatherer or trader even to mend his fortunes land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland post feel the savagery, the utter savagery of clothes round him. All that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. There's no initiation either into such mysteries. He has to live in the midst of the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. And it has a fascination, too, that goes to work upon him. The fascination of the abomination, you know, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. So first off, like, what is he comparing his own journey up the Congo to here? The colonization of I mean, not Europe, but Britain, England. Yeah. So who are these European pioneers, quote unquote, in the Congo, like implicitly here? Yeah. So yeah, he's talking about a time when the Romans were the great civilized imperial power, right? And the Thames was peopled, uh, you know, by a small number of Celtic tribes who lived in the woods and painted themselves blue, right? And like how lousy and difficult this must have been for a Roman coming up the river. And how they're just thinking about the promotions they're gonna get back home and things of that nature, right? And when he gets, when he goes up the Congo, right? When he's going up the river so far to like to get to the station here, what is what does that look like? How is the you know the mission here going? It's depressing. Okay. Everything is just kind of dilapidated, decaying, which I guess links back to the decadence idea of it all. Uh -huh. But all these little outposts and like little places here and there, they're just all kind of described as being decayed. Yeah, how, how much work is actually going on? Not a lot. There's supposed to be stuff going on, right? Yeah. 
right? Like there's a, they're supposed to be building a railroad, but apparently there's only one rail car. It's been it's undersized and turned over. Um, can Marlow even get his ship fixed? No. Yeah, he, he gets there, and the ship he's supposed to be taking out in the interior has been scuttled. And he can't fix it because he can't get any rivets to fix it. So any work that's being done here is being done mostly apparently by prisoners, right? And it's just kind of a veneer over the real activity that's being conducted on the river. And we already know what that real activity is here, right? Much like all of this, it's just a cover for extraction of ivory. So, if we look at this in terms of the way Marlowe completes his thoughts about colonization on page four. Can I get somebody to read for us the paragraph that starts with mine he began again, lifting one arm from the elbow? Thank you. Mine he began again, lifting one arm from the elbow, the palm of the hand outward, so that with his legs folded before him, he had the pose of a Buddha preaching in European clothes and without a lotus flower. Mind, none of us would feel exactly like this. What saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency. But these chaps were not much account, really. They were, they were no colonists. Their administrators were merely a squeeze, and nothing more, I suspect. They were conquerors, and for that, you want only brute force. Nothing to boast of. When you have it, since your strength is just an, it's just an accident arising from the weakness of others, they grabbed what they could get for the sake of what was to be got. It was just robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a grand scale, and men going out of line, as is very proper for those who tackle a darkness. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it, the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or a slightly flatter nose than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only. An idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. Okay, thank you. So, is he talking in this paragraph about the Belgians, or is he talking, or still, is he still talking about the Romans? I think he's talking about both. Okay. Why do you think he's talking about both? I mean, you would assume he's talking about the Romans, but are just like, they just came to the right. just like... And that follows logically from yeah. what he said before, yeah. But also, as you read further, you realize that's exactly what the Belgians were doing. They were just going yeah. out there, taking what they wanted, killing mm -hmm. people, living their best life. Yeah, and he's, a, and he's already talked about like the Thames and the Congo as really being part of the same river, right? This just kind of one river that stretches around the world. It's just, the Romans, it was like, 200 BC. <laughs> now it's 1890. Yeah. So it's just yeah. This this is you know more distant past for people who live on the banks of the Thames, right? But what about this last thing he says here? Like it starts with like what redeems it is the idea only. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think that means? I mean, they presented this as like, oh, we're going to go down there, stop the slave trade, set up like a better life for uh -huh. these Africans. And all in all, it does seem like a pretty good idea, like saving people from slavery, trying to set up a better life for them, but mm -hmm. now they're just going to go down there and steal ivory and leave. <laughs> okay. That it, so the idea that it can be redeemed by some sort of noble purpose, right? And I just want to, there's, there's a symbol of that noble purpose later on. Um, when he's talking with the guy with the, uh, the guy who's kind of like the, man the manager's toady at the station, page 21. Okay. Bottom of the page, then I noticed a small sketch in oils on a panel representing a woman draped and blindfolded carrying a lighted torch. 
The background was somber, almost black. The movement of the woman was stately, and the effect of the torchlight on the face was sinister. So this is a drawing that's been done by Kurtz and left at the station, right? So what's weird about this drawing? Particularly if we're thinking about like what you know, the civilizing mission as a kind of redemptive um, idea. Is it supposed to represent like the image of like justice or liberty? It, yeah, it kind of sounds like both, right? You know, liberty is you know the woman in a toga holding the torch, right? And justice as you know blindfold. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I think that, yeah. The liberty and justice here. What else is weird about this? A woman draped in blindfolded, carrying a lighted torch. The background was somber, almost black. The movement of the woman was stately, and the effect of the torchlight on the face was sinister. I mean, justice and liberty are supposed to like represent the good things. Like there are yeah. the little like flight statues that you see on top of like buildings, but uh -huh. he calls it sinister. Like, yeah, I mean, they're coming in and they're just going to wreak havoc in the name of liberty and justice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but like, yeah, the, these are like the, the civic values of the Enlightenment, right? You know, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Bree, what were you going to say? I kind of took it a different way. Um, what if it's... So we've been talking about how this colonization attempts and everything is just a cover for obtaining material goods. Uh-huh. What if it's a representation of blind desire? Because fire mm -hmm. is usually represented with desire. We associate it uh -huh. with the devil, hell, Hades, which is uh -huh. usually that corruptness. It's the burning fire of desire within someone. <laughs> and they're blindly doing whatever it takes to obtain what they desire. Okay. And that usually takes a very sinister effect once you really look into it because mm -hmm. when someone does whatever it takes to get what they want, they usually end up doing some pretty awful things. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask you, like, can it be both? Definitely. I feel like her description best describes Kurtz. Okay. So it's Kurtz is the one who drew it. Uh huh. But I feel like all, like, for Kurtz, that's definitely what it represents. But I feel like all our, we can see it as that, but also both, obviously. Uh huh. Well, remember, to the, the, this, this guy then accuses Marlowe of being part of the gang of virtue, right, that Kurtz represents. So we're getting a sense as we learn more about Kurtz that he has come under the auspices of a group like this one, right? Like the International African Association, not so much like the International Congo Society. And this guy doesn't trust Marlowe because he thinks he's one of these, one of these goody two-shoes, right? Who is going to, um, you know, try to change the way things are done around here and thus jeopardize his chance for a promotion. Now, right, what do you all think about this? Okay. I think that, um, I want to kind of like, like go back to the whole, um, like the idea of the blindfold as well, right? So on the one hand, yeah, we usually use that to represent justice and fairness, right? The justice is impartial. But what can it also mean, particularly given like the somber black background here and the way the novel treats Africa as blank space? Ignorance? Yeah. to the problems that are actually going on. Yes. 
<laughs> and not only that, but also ignorance of what's out there, right? To the people in this station here, this is the unknown. Right, you're going out and you know taking your little steamboat. Going over elephants. Yeah, exactly, right? Or um, or if you're looking for a guy who's supposed to be looking for elephants um, out in the forest, right? And so the forest is, like as we all know, right, this kind of the forest or the wilderness. Right, is this kind of you know conventional symbol of the irrational. And the unconscious. And I think this is another thing I want us to try to track um, as we read the rest of the novel, right? There is, he is playing sometimes, at, 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 in some cases, with this distinction we were already talking about. Um, that Nietzsche makes between the ideas of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, right? The Apollonian, you know, form and order being associated with the white sepulchral city. And the Dionysian being connected to the African forest. And also, right. uh, the further you get into the jungle, the crazier it gets. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the more irrational it seems to Marlowe, right? And, you know, we talked about, you know, that white sepulchral city. I want to finish today by noting, like, some, what, part of what it's juxtaposed against here, right, on page 23. I let him run on, this papier-mâché Mephistopheles. And it seemed to me that if I tried, I could poke at my forefinger, my forefinger through it and would find nothing inside of a little loose dirt, maybe. He, don't you see, had been planning to be assistant manager by and by under the present man. And I could see that the coming of that hurts and upset them both not a little. He talked precipitately, and I did not try to stop him. I had my shoulders against the wreck of my steamer hauled up on the slope like a carcass of some big river animal. The smell of mud, of primeval mud by Jove, was in my nostrils. The high stillness of primeval forest was before my eyes. There were shiny patches on the black creek. So one thing that I want you all to try to keep track of is the places where Conrad juxtaposes something white against something black, right? So like, for example, in the beginning, did anybody know the game that the accountant takes out for everyone to play? Either, uh, dominoes. 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 Yeah, he pulls out some dominoes, which are white within black, right? Um, so look out for those sorts of things, right? But so, as opposed to the white sepulchral city, here we have the primeval mud, the primeval forest. So the white sepulchral city is at the end of its history. What does primeval mean? If something's primeval, what does that mean? Does anybody know? <laughs> so primeval is like, like kind of like before history, right? Like almost prehistoric. So this is the place where history is about to start happening, but has not yet, right? That's the way it's conceptualized here in the novel. So one of the things I want you all to pay attention to, again, is also this kind of like the way it treats time and the relationship between time and history. All right, so does anybody have any questions before I give you the, the guide questions and let you go? All right. And you know, like I said, I'm not gonna try to make you like this book. I don't like this book myself, but 
I hope this is going better for some of you in previous years.